when when did Roddy Bryan know the McMichaels brought guns? When did Roddy Bryan know Travis McMichael would shoot Mr. Arbery? And at that point, what could Roddy Bryan have done to stop it? The inconvenient truth is that Roddy Bryan did not know and could not know that these men were armed until moments before Mr. Arbery's tragic death. He did not know and could not know that Arbery would be shot. And by that time, sadly, there was nothing Roddy Bryan could do to prevent this tragedy. Roddy Bryan didn't shoot anyone. At the time of the shooting, he was some distance back. He was armed only with his cell phone. Isn't it time, isn't it time, ladies and gentlemen, that we send Roddy Bryan home? Roddy Bryan fully cooperated with the police. He's given several different statements. He's provided the now famous video that you've seen so many times and probably will again before we're done. Roddy provided his cell phone multiple times. He signed all kinds of consent forms. He gives them access to his truck. He gives them the night owl videos from his house, the videos that had been overlooked in the canvassing of the neighborhood because he was down at the police station. He gives them his social media. He gives them his Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, without Roddy Bryan, there is no case. You will have to decide what justice looks like between the McMichaels and Mr. Arbery, between the McMichaels and the Arbery family. But the reason that you can do so, the reason that we can have this trial is because of Roddy Bryan. Roddy's decision to cooperate with law enforcement to help them discover the truth about the events of February 23rd, 2020 is not the product of slick lawyering. Roddy Bryan had no lawyer on the side of the road in the minutes after Ahmad Arbery was shot. It was not some lawyer. It was Roddy Bryan without any lawyer without any help, without any assistance, making that decision on his own. Roddy Bryan made the choice. Roddy Bryan decided to invite Officer Minshew to sit with him in his truck, even before Roddy Bryan has a chance to look at the video himself. All this again without a lawyer. These actions, ladies and gentlemen, demonstrate good faith. His conduct negatives any inference of criminal intent. Who is Roddy Bryan? Roddy never served his country like Travis McMichael. Roddy never served his community like Greg McMichael. Roddy is a quiet man. Roddy repairs small engines at the local hardware store. Roddy knows most of the English language, or so he believes. Roddy Bryan keeps to his, himself. His neighbors don't really even know who he is, even though he's lived in the neighborhood for three years. Roddy is not boastful or a braggart. He is not loud or boisterous. He is not an attention seeker. Roddy tries to avoid bad language, not always successfully. Roddy is respectful. He's an ordinary guy, a regular guy. Roddy Bryan is no vigilante. There's no evidence of that. Roddy isn't running around Satilla Shores with guns, openly carried in broad daylight. He didn't even bother to report the theft of his own trailer. After all, it's just stuff. That's what insurance is for. The Abhishev is saying, what you take into your hand, you take into your heart. Roddy Bryan grabbed his cell phone. That's not intended as a comment upon anyone else, but that's just who Roddy is. What else does the evidence tell us about Roddy Bryan? Is Roddy Bryan the smartest guy in the room? Is he like some kind of 
rocket scientist? In these interviews that Mr. Bryan gives to the police, is there some clever wordplay like Mr. Bryan is smarter than everybody else? Is that what the evidence suggests in this case? The evidence suggests that Roddy Bryan legitimately struggles to find the right words, that Roddy struggles at times to convey the meaning, the truth behind those words. There is no evidence that he is a wordsmith, no evidence that Roddy was playing word games with law enforcement officers. He simply can't find the right words. The evidence in this case shows that context is key. If you honestly seek the truth here, which is your duty as jurors, if you listen carefully, you will see that what Roddy Bryan means, as opposed to simply hearing his actual words, it is clear that he never wished to hit Ahmaud Arbery. Why the prosecution felt it necessary to phrase the things the way they did in their opening statement, Ms. Ms. Dunikoski will have to answer to you for. I was unable to play it earlier, but we are now going to try and play the excerpt from the interview with Mr. Lowry, specifically that most damaging part of his statement, where he supposedly wishes that he had hit Ahmaud Arbery. Um, you said that you had you had handprints on your truck from where the guy was trying to get into it. Yeah, I feel pretty sure that's what he was doing. I mean, I can't say for sure that he was up there. He wasn't on the door. I didn't give him a chance to get to the door. But after I angled him off the side of the road, you know, um, and I kind of went on past him because I didn't hit him, um, which I would have. You know, might have took him out and shot. But you know, I probably got past him a little bit, and he'd come up on me, and I could see him in my mirror, and he's coming over the door. And I seen his hands on right behind the door. Ladies and gentlemen, in the video, as opposed to the officer's testimony, you can see Mr. Bryan's demeanor. You can see his gestures and his mannerisms. And you can see that when he says that he wished he hit Mr. Arbery, he said that just after he says that he didn't hit him, and he's expressing regret because Mr. Arbery has died. And maybe if he hadn't gotten down where he was, he wouldn't have been shot. That is much, much different in context than to suggest that Roddy Bryan wished that he had hit Mr. Arbery. That's a reflection of regret that Mr. Arbery was hurt by the McMichaels. That's certainly not a suggestion that he bore any ill will. And how many other instances of that do we have in this case? How many other times has the district attorney's office fired cheap shots at Roddy Bryant? How many times have the GBI taken cheap shots at Mr. Bryant? And in the end, you may wish to ask yourself why. Now, in the defense case, and we, we're not, we didn't do it, we promised we wouldn't, but it's clear that Mr. Bryan did not wish to strike Mr. Arbery, that he never had any intention of hurting Mr. Arbery. He never said anything to the contrary. The evidence will show that he had no knowledge, no reason to believe that anyone else out there meant to hurt or shoot Mr. Arbery. If they had a secret intention or desire to do that, it could not be known to him. Now, there is another excerpt that I want to play from the Minshew video, only one, okay? Because again, I think it shows you Mr. Bryan's demeanor. It has been suggested by the state that much of what Mr. Bryan says later is somehow an after-the-fact rationalization of what happened that day. But when you listen to this, I think you'll see that Mr. Bryan's, the truth of what Mr. Bryan is trying to convey hasn't really changed.
Now, obviously, there's a reason we all don't play more of these. Go ahead, young lady. What, what, you know, what did it look like he was trying to do? He was trying to get, he was trying to get on this side of the car, right? What did it look like he was trying to do? What? Yeah, I mean, I'd cut him off pretty good now, you okay. know, but he, I mean, did he, put, he actually he pulled was, your handle? I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's in the marks right there. Okay. He was trying to get to the handle. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, did uh, nobody got us on video? You just witnessed it, yeah, correct? I got it. You I got it on video? I ain't looked at it. Okay. You ready? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you want to well, at what point did you start videoing? Well, I thought he was going to get away. Okay. So that was. So the you, you was getting, trying to get a, uh, c capture who he looked like? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I probably got two videos, three videos. I mean, I probably okay. started over here. I don't know what I got because okay. half the time I was trying to drive. It was suggested that Roddy Bryan made up the idea that he was trying to preserve Mr. Arbery's identity, that he was trying to preserve it because he thought he was going to get away. It's been suggested that that's not what was going on. But yet, here, on the side of the road with Officer Minshew, Roddy Bryan says within minutes of the shooting that that's exactly what he was trying to do. We have one video in this case. Well, we have two, a shorter version of the one you've seen. But when Mr. Bryan is talking with Officer Minshew, he hasn't had a chance to look at his phone. He hasn't had a chance to see what he has. He thinks he has two or three videos. He thinks he's caught much more than he had. Now, either you believe that Roddy Bryan is the smartest person in this room, that he's playing games and manipulating the police from the moment this has happened, or you know that Roddy Bryan had good faith from the start, that he tried as best he could to help the police. Maybe it would have been better if he had been able to record more, if he knew better how to operate his phone. But the idea that somehow Mr. Bryan is quote unquote minimizing his involvement in this case, had he recovered as much video as he thought he had, he might have had the whole thing on video. And he's giving it to the police. He's inviting Officer Minshew to sit with him in the car, to look at it with him for the first time. Not with some slick Cobb County lawyer. By himself. That tells you that Roddy Bryan is not guilty. Because unless you think he's smarter than everybody else in this room, that he's smarter than all these police officers, that he's smarter than the cream of the crop, the creme de la creme of the GBI, then you know he's trying to tell you the truth. He just can't always find the words. And to hear again all this stuff about Mr. Bryan, about all these things that happened, we'll come back to that later. When you look at the Lowry interview, when you look at Mr. Minshew, the, 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 the Minshew discussion on the side of the road, you know, you know what the truth is here. Now, if I'm out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, but again, as I said before, the events of this day from Mr. Bryan's perspective are chaos. Mr. Bryan doesn't know what happened up the street at the English residence. He doesn't know Mr. Albenzi is out there. He doesn't know Mr. Albenzi's called 911. He assumes somebody's called 911, and he was correct, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know that Mr. Albenzi is armed and just up the street. Mr. Bryan is not in communication with anyone prior to the shooting, not Mr. Albenzi, not Diego Perez, not Gregory or Travis McMichael. At times, as you've heard, Mr. Bryan feels like he's alone out there with Mr. Arbery, and it scares him. Roddy Bryan doesn't see any guns until moments before the shooting. We'll come back to that. I think, if I recall correctly, the testimony was, although you can see, and you will see in a moment, Greg McMichael standing in the back of the pickup truck in the moments before the shooting, Mr. Bryan, on that day, doesn't even recall Gregory McMichael being in the back of the truck. 
He doesn't realize Gregory McMichael's in the back of the truck until later, until afterwards. Roddy Bryan thinks that it takes the police several minutes to arrive on the scene when we know it was, a mere, it was mere seconds. Roddy gets so many basic facts wrong, so many key facts. Is it any surprise that months later he would struggle to recall details of what happened that day when he couldn't recall big, obvious details right at the time it happened? Let me shift gears for a moment. Closing statement is sometimes referred to as closing argument. Let me assure you, I don't want to argue about you with the evidence. First of all, there's 12 of you. There's only one of me, and you get the last word. Second, you know, lawyers, we tend to remember things, frankly, sometimes the way we wanted them to be or the way we expected them to be, whereas you hear it as it actually comes out. So if my recollection differs from yours, I would trust your collective memory. And I'm not supposed to say this. Okay, we're all taught never to say this, but what we say as lawyers is not evidence. The evidence is what you heard. And if something I say doesn't ring true to you is what the evidence is, you don't have to wait for someone else to object. I don't want you to consider something if you don't remember it as the evidence. Now, before proceeding any further and before I forget, I do want to express my gratitude to Mr. Bryan to the court, uh, to my distinguished opposing counsel. As I walk through the front doors of our courthouse every day, I am reminded what an honor and absolute privilege it, it has been to come before you. What I'd like to do now is go back in time. I want to take you back, if you can join me, to the morning of February 23rd, 2020. It seems, at least to me, both so very far away and yet like it was yesterday. It was a time to which many of us might wish to return, if only we could turn back time. Ahmaud Arbery is still very much alive, perhaps still asleep. Some of us, like Rook Perez and her husband Diego, have gone off to church. Others read the Sunday paper. The politically minded may recall Bernie Sanders is the front runner for the Democrat nomination. The sports-minded may recall that the Daytona 500 had been held a week earlier down the road. Donald Trump was the Grand Marshal. And our local newspaper, the Brunswick News, covers school events, school events celebrating Black History Month. You may recall COVID-19 is still a mystery. It's a China problem, an Italian problem. Some guy we've never heard of Dr. Anthony Fauci warns us that we should conserve the already dwindling supply of masks for first responders and for health care workers who most need them. But Roddy Bryan isn't reading the Sunday paper. Roddy Bryan is not in church. And he probably isn't paying much attention to the corona. Roddy Bryan is working on the front porch of his home. After running for several years, Roddy and his fiance have just purchased their home on Burford. As a small engine repair guy working at the local hardware store, this is a big deal for Roddy, and he isn't going to waste any time before fixing it up. When you think back, it was a different world, but it's the world in which these events take place, and it's in that context that we have to look at the evidence in this case. Now. I think we have the first Night Owl video. I call it the first Night Owl video, the porch video. I think we played it for you once before. Here you can see Roddy Bryan standing on his front porch trying to repair a column. He is listening to music. The music is playing from the, in the garage. The door is open. We've seen that from the previous picture. We'll see in a moment his truck is out front. If you look carefully, I believe you can see his hammer on the ground behind him. And I believe other tools as well. Now, we'll stop that. Now we have a still photo, which we are about to turn back on. The still photo? Sorry. 
beggars can't be choosers, so I'm going to wait on Miss Barton. This is the front of the Bryan residence. You have to add in Mr. Bryan on the porch. You have to add in pickup truck in the driveway with lumber in the back. You have to imagine, if you will, the music playing, and it's probably playing loud because his hearing's not so good. Is there anything threatening or menacing about this picture? Is there anything threatening or menacing about this image? Or is this something we'd expect to see in a Norman Rockwell painting? We talk about driveway decisions. Mr. Arbery has driveway decisions that he's making this morning. I'm not going back into all that stuff with the Englishes and Diego Perez and Matt Albenzi and Robert Rash. That's already been covered. And, and although Mr. Bryan may well have read about it on the exit 29 page, he doesn't recall it, at least on this day. But Mr. Arbery is now running down the street, running from the English residence. He's passing house after house after house on a nice Sunday afternoon. Is there any evidence that Mr. Arbery sought help, sought assistance from anyone in that neighborhood up to this point? Maybe you heard it. I didn't. But as he comes up to Mr. Bryan's residence, as he starts coming by his house, why isn't Mr. Arbery asking for help? Why isn't he calling out? Hey, somebody call 911. There's crazy people after me. Maybe that's because Mr. Arbery doesn't want help. Now, Mr. Bryan spots Mr. Arbery out of the corner of his eye. All right, we do have to take a break here on Court TV, but we will bring you anything you've missed when we come back on the other side. Welcome back. So the attorney for William Roddy Bryan is in closing arguments, and we're going to take you right back now live. Sorry, you went too quickly. Let's, there he is. Okay, watch carefully. Mr. Bryan has said on some occasions he walked to the kitchen. On another occasion, he said he ran to the kitchen. He said he walked back out to the truck. Another time, he said he ran back out to the truck. Well, what we know from this video, it takes 13 seconds to get from the edge of the driveway into the kitchen to reach the keys and go back out to the truck. Mr. Bryan is, in fact, walking calmly to the kitchen and walking calmly to the truck. And his recollection of doing otherwise is faulty. Now, we also know, as Mr. Bryan pulls out, and by the way, we also know that he left his rifle in the house, left a hammer on the porch, and went out with his cell phone. Now, here we see when Mr. Bryan initially pulls out, Mr. Bryan is pointed to the right. Now, he backs up. Now, it's, at the very end, he, he backs up and he straightens out a bit. Whether Mr. Bryan said he was going to the left or the center or slightly to the left, the actual evidence in the case is consistent with him pulling straight out. And again, we know from all the other things that we've seen that Mr. Bryant's recollection of events that day simply isn't that good. Now, Mr. Arbery, not Mr. Arbery, Mr. Bryan makes what is for him a very faithful decision. He actually pulls out in the road. Now, at one point he says he overshot the road. Another point in the same interview with De Detective Lowry, he says that he crept out onto the road. The state suggests that Mr. Bryan either hit Mr. Arbery or tried to hit him 
and pushed him with his 5,000-pound motor vehicle. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but I just don't think there's, uh, I think the evidence is inconsistent with that. Now, I do want to talk about the indictment for a minute. Thank you. Let's take a minute to review the indictment. It is what we sometimes call a kitchen sink indictment. Everyone, all three defendants are charged literally with everything in the indictment. Every crime set forth therein. You may find this confusing and difficult to sort through at times since the factual bases and underlying legal bases for the five murder counts are so closely intertwined with one another. However, this is perfectly acceptable. There's nothing improper about it. Murder is murder. Each of the remaining four counts of the indictment, aggravated assault with a shotgun, aggravated assault with a motor vehicle or motor vehicles, false imprisonment, and attempted false imprisonment, actually serve as predicate felonies for the felony murder counts. In other words, this indictment does not allege any offense against any defendant other than murder and the predicate offenses for murder. There are a couple of legal principles that feel obligated to go over in every case. One of those is reasonable doubt. Now you've already heard several very capable lawyers go through that, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. Without belaboring the point, however, I would refer you to what I consider the core principles at the heart of the court's charge on reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt means just what it says. It is the doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. If you are a fair-minded, impartial juror honestly seeking the truth, and you've certainly given us every reason to believe that you are, if at the end of the evidence you have a doubt, that is a doubt upon which you may acquit the defendant. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based on common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given. If you can give a reason to doubt whether Mr. Bryan is guilty, then your mission is complete. And at that point, you should acquit Mr. Bryan. Now, I also often use this provision lifted from Robert Bolt, a man for all seasons, when I talk about reasonable doubt, because I find it helpful. And let's be clear, it is not a statement of the law, it is the principle behind it. You, some of you may be familiar with the play and the movie, some of you may not. William Roper asks Sir Thomas More, so now you give the devil the benefit of law. Sir Thomas More says, yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil. William Roper says, yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Sir Thomas More replies, oh, and when the last law was down, and the devil turned round on you. Where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, and you're just a man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I give the devil benefit of law, Sir Thomas More says, for my own safety's sake. And when you apply the reasonable doubt standard, remember that standard, that legal principle, isn't there for Roddy Bryan. It's not there for these other defendants. It's there for all of us. And it's a principle that we cannot forsake. The court's going to charge you, I believe, without trying to put words in his mouth on parties to a crime. The provision that's relevant to Mr. Bryan in this case is the second one. To be a party to the crime, Mr. Bryan must intentionally help in the commission of an offense, of a crime. Mr. Bryan cannot be a party to a crime by accident. He can only be a party to the crime intentionally. And we'll come back to that principle again. Now, count one is murder. and. I don't want to tread over the same ground that 
other council have tread, but the, the issues are somewhat different for Mr. Bryan. I hesitate even to respond to count one because by doing so, I don't want any of you to think for a moment that there's anything here even worthy of a reply, but I am required to do so. Roddy Bryan didn't shoot Mr. Arbery. He was armed only with a cell phone and he was a good distance away when the shots rang out. Roddy did not cause and could not cause Mr. Arbery's death within the meaning of this statute. Roddy was not the shooter, so he could not shoot Mr. Arbery unlawfully. Roddy did not shoot him at all. Roddy Bryan acted in good faith on the day in question. There is no evidence whatsoever of malice. And most importantly, and I, I, get, I think this echoes arguments made by others, nor can Roddy be a party to the crime of malice murder because there is no evidence that Roddy Bryan intentionally helped Travis McMichael murder Mr. Arbery. Where is that evidence? And that takes us back to the three questions I asked a moment ago when I first stood up. Roddy Bryant certainly was not aware of any intention on the part of Travis McMichael to shoot Mr. Arbery. And I'm not saying he had that intention. You will have to decide what Travis McMichael did or did not do. But Roddy Bryant certainly was not aware of any such intention and certainly could not be a party to the crime of malice murder because he can't intentionally help commit a crime he doesn't know is underway, doesn't know is contemplated. At this point, we're going to try and go back and play the video again, the, the famous video. But I'm going to repeat the three questions that I started with. When did Roddy Bryan know that McMichaels brought guns with them? When did Roddy Bryan know Travis McMichael would shoot Mr. Arbery? And at what point, what, at that point rather, what could Roddy Bryan do to stop it? We ready? All right. Now, I'm going to try and keep up with this video. At point oh three seconds into this video, Mr. Arbery turns around on Holmes. Now, stop. What I want you to do is not so much look at the video at this point. Listen with your ears to the noises in the background because they tell you what's really going on, even when what you see on the screen is unclear. At point .04, you'll hear Roddy Bryan tap the brakes. He's still in drive, and you'll see he's going at approximately two miles per hour. very, very difficult to get this video precise. Yes, we're looking for four seconds. We're looking for the speed on the speedometer. What you can see is that Mr. Bryan is, you hear him tap the brakes. You hear Mr. Bryan tap his brakes, but he's still in drive and he's going about two miles per hour, which is about the same speed that Mr. Arbery is moving. He's been described as chasing Mr. Arbery, as hunting Mr. Arbery, as attempting to run Mr. Arbery down. 
But what you see on the video, and there is the, the you can see that Mr. Bryan is moving at approximately two miles an hour, and you can see that the seat belt is not in place. Now, at this point, we're going to go ahead and play it to about the 17 second mark. Listen for the, for the gear shifts. I'm sorry, it's not there yet. Go ahead. You can see Mr. Bryant's foot is not on the gas pedal. Now, you hear a motor vehicle go by. We can guess which vehicle that is. But we hear it pass. And then at 20 seconds, we're going to hear the seatbelt alarm go off. Now, at 26 seconds, you can hear the transmission shift as Mr. Bryan puts his truck in park. And then two seconds later, you'll hear Mr. Bryan buckle his seatbelt. Now, at about 30 seconds, and I'm going to go through this with you before we play it so you'll know what to listen for, Mr. Bryan utters the famous words, I'm going to keep going. And you'll notice that his cell phone is down. This is where he says, I'm going to keep going. And the state is suggesting to you, if I recall the opening statement and the opening portion today, that this is where Mr. Bryan is turning around to give chase to Mr. Arbery in the moments before his death. But if you listen carefully, I think you'll hear a somewhat different story and a different truth. You know what? Mr. Bryan says, I'm going to keep going. He's put the car in gear. But if you watch, you'll see Mr. Bryan isn't going back towards Mr. Arbery. He's not going back towards the McMichaels. He's going in the opposite direction. And he starts at a high rate of speed. Here, the wheels lose traction slightly. Now, you can't see yet, but he's not moving towards Mr. Arbery. He's moving away, and you'll see why in a moment. Now, here you can see the speedometer is, at this point, he's slowed back down. He's at four miles an hour at the 51-second mark. And shortly after this, you hear him put the, the shift the transmission again. And I think you'll see it's clear from the context, which is a K turn that he is putting the truck into reverse, and then a few seconds later, he puts it back into drive. This is the K-turn near the top of Holmes that you see on the reenactment video. Uh, top of Holmes near Zellwood. Go ahead. When I start the video up, when we start the video up, and it's, it's a team project here. When we start the video up, listen for Mr. Bryan's breathing. I think when you hear his breathing, you will hear something different than the state has suggested. Now, I can't tell you how to interpret it, but what I hear is someone who is labored breathing, breathing as if he was in fear. Also, around the same time, watch Mr. Bryan's leg, which is momentarily visible on the gas pedal, and see whether you don't agree that Mr. Bryan's leg is literally shaking. Now, you know, he's not driving a Cadillac. I'm sure there's vibration in the vehicle, but if you watch his leg in relation to the rest of the car, to the rest of the truck, I think you'll agree that Mr. Bryan, at this point, is shaking. All right, let's try that again. Very good. 
did we play the right portion there? Do we miss it? Okay. All right. At this point, Roddy Bryan is looking down, back down Holmes. Now, what does he do here? He's pulled up his cell phone. His cell phone's been down because he was driving away. When Mr. Bryan said that he was going home, when he said the guy didn't want to be caught, that's all consistent with this video. Now we can see that he's turned around. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, why is he turning around? Technically, this is the shorter path back to his house. It may be easier to get in the driveway. You can see the bushes in the uh, video out front. Maybe. Maybe he's trying to document what's going on. He said that's what he was trying to do. Maybe, and that's just me going out on a limb, I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps, and I know I'll get grief for this, I would submit to you that you can call it karma, you can call it fate, I would call it divine providence. Somebody is guiding Mr. Bryan, whether it's a conscious thought process or not. Something is guiding Mr. Bryan down this street to document what's going on. Just like Mr. Bryan's on his porch. Why does he go out? He doesn't know. He gets in his car, he sits out there, he doesn't even know why. He's being guided, whether that's by a god, if you believe in a god, uh, or by some other entity. But do you really believe it's just coincidence or chance? Do you really believe Mr. Bryan is trying to lie or deceive you at this point? But we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue playing the video. <clears throat> Okay. Mr. Bryan is traveling as he testified, as an agent indicated in the reenactment video. He's traveling at 10 or 15 miles an hour. He's traveling faster than Mr. Arbery. But clearly, if he was trying to hunt him down, he would be going a lot faster. <coughs> More to the point, at this point, as Mr. Bryan comes around the dog leg, what we're seeing here, I can't be sure whether this is the enhanced video or not, but what we're seeing here in this courtroom with the artificial interior lighting is certainly a better view than Mr. Bryan has actually looking through that phone with the glare and other stuff that's going to be in the car on a sunny day. Anyone who's tried to look at pictures on their phone while they're driving on a day like this, understands that sometimes you can't see the phone at all. But assuming that Mr. Bryan has 20-20 vision and assuming that he has every bit as good a view of his phone as he's driving as you see here, where is Travis McMichael? I can't see Travis McMichael in this picture. Really, honestly, I can't see Greg McMichael in this picture. And I certainly can't see any guns. Now, what's our, what's our post on this one? Where is this? This is at 1.15 into a minute and 43 second video. And Mr. Bryant at this point has no reason to know that the individuals in that truck have guns. All right, let's, okay. All right, you, you can still, at this point, I think you can see that there's a shadow, a silhouette of what's Travis McMichael. But from where Mr. Bra Mr. Bryan is in his vehicle, again, even if he has a perfect view of his phone, you can't see a weapon. You can't see anybody's armed. All right, we're going to go forward again. At 1.15... Now watch, you see that Mr. Bryan's phone is focused to the right of the truck. Why? Because Roddy Bryan doesn't know Matt Albenzi is down on Jones at 220 Satilla with his phone and his gun. The McMichaels know because Mr. Albenzi is giving them the hand signal. Mr. Arbery knows because he's run out of the house away from Mr. Albenzi. But Roddy Bryan doesn't know that. Roddy Bryan is thinking, 
that Mr. Arbery, like he has for the last minute or so that he's been out there, that Mr. Arbery is just going to go around the truck like he's gone around the trucks the whole time and head out Satilla towards the exit to the neighborhood. All right, go ahead again. At 116, Travis's silhouette should come in view. Now, that's Greg McMichael. Or he passed that. Okay. Now there's Greg McMichael in the back of the truck. Now we know that he has a gun. I think at this point he's on the cell phone. But I, for Mr. Roddy Bryan's vantage point, looking through this phone as he's trying to drive on a sunny day in his truck, how can Mr. Bryan know that Greg McMichael has a gun or that he's drawn it? He can't. Go ahead. Go to 121, play it to 121. All right, this is 121. You can see Mr. Arbery. You can see how far back Mr. Bryan is. And you can see Mr. Arbery going to the left momentarily. And way over here, and I, will, I promise not to touch the screen. This little fuzzy black thing here, this silhouette, is Travis McMichael. Where, on this video, putting aside the fact that Mr. Bryant's not going to have as good a view driving on a sunny day in his car, from this video alone, where is Mr. Travis McMichael's shotgun? Roddy Bryant can't see any weapon. He has no reason to know that these men are armed. And at this point, there's 20 seconds left in this video. and We're just going to go ahead and play it. And you tell me, in your mind, because you can't tell me, figure out when Roddy Bryan can see Travis McMichael's shotgun. Because Roddy's looking the wrong way. He's looking to the right, expecting the Arbery to run off. Wow. We're now at what? Where are we on the timestamp? Uh, We're now at 128. Roddy Bryan has never seen. And I don't care what is in any prior statement. We know, looking at this video, Roddy Bryant's never seen the shotgun until after it's been discharged the first time. That's not an opinion. That's fact. You're looking at it. You just never looked at it from this perspective before. Let's go ahead and play it. All right, we are going to, it's the top of the hour, take a break. We will be right back here on the other side of continuing live coverage of closing arguments here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Always happy to be with you. We are going to take you live back to court just to tell you what's going on. This attorney, Attorney Golf, who represents the defendant, William Roddy Bryant, is going at detail through detail, frame by frame of that video to say, my client was there, but he was not an active participant in a crime. Way back, moments after the shooting. Now, having seen that Mr. Bryan was going away and then turned around and put the video back up. How is that not a reasonable doubt in this case? Now, I don't know what Ms. Donikowski is going to say, Donikowski, I'm sorry, is going to say when she gets back up here. I do know that it seems like every technician in creation has been involved in this case. Drone this, footage that, filter this, enhance that. We got 20 million frames of every second of the footage in this case. But how, in the course of all that work, does someone who's practically computer illiterate figure out that they have this case all wrong? How is that possible? And how do you know that? Count the gear shifts, ladies and gentlemen. The state's theory is that there's three shifts Three changes in direction, that's six gear shifts. They're not audible. We know what happened. And I don't care what Travis McMichael says. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm looking at the video, and I'm listening for the changes. 
you know that when this, right here, when Mr. Arbery turns around, and whatever Mr. Bryan thinks he's doing with the wheel, I don't see much actual movement, okay? I see him at two miles an hour and then his foot's off the gas pedal. Whatever Mr. Bryan thinks he did, I don't think it was much. But you know that he's driving away from Mr. Arbery at this point because he can't go back and then go back and then go back again because there aren't enough gear shifts. All right, we're, I think we're done with that one. I want to talk to you about felony murder. Now, there are more capable lawyers than I in this courtroom, and they certainly have come up with great ways to analyze all these things that make it simple. I'm just not quite as, as, as adept as they are. So if I take a little longer, I apologize. The predicate offenses for the felony murder counts, those are counts two, three, four, and five, or count six, seven, eight, and nine, and I will address each of the underlying or predicate felonies in a moment. But right now I want to talk about something called proximate cause. Because to support any of the felony murder counts in this case, there has to be a causal relationship to the death of Ahmaud Arbery. And there is no such relationship in this case. Without trying to put words in the court's mouth, uh, I think the court's going to charge you, well, I'm not there yet. You, you may find the defendant guilty of felony murder if you believe that Mr. Bryan caused the death of Mr. Arbery, regardless of whether Mr. Bryan intended the death to occur, that's felony murder. There must be some causal connection between the felony and the death. The court, I believe, will instruct you that felony murder is not established simply because the death occurred at the same time or shortly after the felony was attempted or committed. The burden on the state is much greater. The felony must have been directly caused, or must have directly caused the death, or played both a substantial and necessary part in causing the death. In this case, you may also consider whether any intervening act, those are my words, whether on the part of the McMichaels or Mr. Arbor were sufficient to break the causal chain of events. Mr. Actually, I believe both of the lawyers that preceded me for the McMichael defendants have pointed out the error in the state's argument here. Listen carefully to the court's charge. The words, but for, appear nowhere in that charge. They are not to be found. Why? Because but four is not the standard. It's too easy a standard. It's too low a standard. It doesn't meet the law. Why? Mr. Sheffield pointed out that but for, I think Mr. Travis McMichael's grandparents, Travis McMichael wouldn't have been there. Likewise, I would say but for Roddy Bryan's birth, there's no way that this crime could have taken place under the state's reasoning. You know, the same thing could be said, but for Larry English installing surveillance cameras. The McMichaels would never have known that this was the fellow running by them. But for Matt Albenzi pulling out his wood chipper that day and working in the front yard, he never would have saw Mr. Arbery. But for the actions of Robert Rash and Diego Perez, this incident might not have happened. But for Mr. Albenzi calling the normal police number instead of 911, the police might have responded faster and things might have been different. But for Mr. Albenzi cutting off the Satilla Drive exit, Mr. Arbery might have escaped. But for a hundred different things, all of which had to come together in the exact sequence for this tragedy to take place, it could not have happened. So simply saying that but for Mr. Bryan being there that day, that's not the standard. And the state doesn't even try and meet the standard that the court is going to instruct you on. Now maybe they're just waiting until they have the last word. And all I can say about that is that's just dirty pool. And I certainly hope that's not what's going on. Now, again, with all respect to the state, who have some very capable lawyers, when we look objectively at the events of February 23rd, 
I would respectfully submit to you that Roddy Bryan's presence is absolutely superfluous and irrelevant to the tragic death of Ahmaud Arbery. Now, that may not be intuitively obvious, but if you think about it, I believe you'll agree. Had Roddy Bryan stayed in bed that day, if Roddy Bryan had stayed on his front porch, would Ahmaud Arbery be alive today? If the state's theory is that these men, and I'm not saying that's the case. You decide what, what the deal is with the co-defendants. But if the theory is that these men were vigilantes and harbored some ill will towards Mr. Arbery, then what difference does it make whether Roddy Bryan is there or not? Mr. Arbery can't outrun bullets. They've been chasing him for, for a while. And he's at practically point blank range even before he comes around the truck. The problem is for the state that Mr. Albenzi, thankfully not indicted, not yet anyway, Mr. Albenzi is down the street with his firearm. Roddy Bryan doesn't know that. That's why Roddy Bryan goes down uh, Satilla momentarily as Mr. Bryan is turning up the road. You'll remember the testimony where the state was trying to say that Mr. Bryan was trying to run him over when in fact Mr. Arbery was, had already turned up Holmes by the time Mr. Bryan put his car in reverse. One of them, several times, they incorrectly stated he was trying to run Mr. Arbery over. The reason that Mr. Bryan is continuing down Satilla is he doesn't know that Mr. Albenzi is there. He can't, but, Roddy, but uh, Mr. Arbery does, which is why Mr. Arbery is not going to go down that way. Now, my point to you is Mr. Arbery is on foot. The McMichaels are in a pickup truck. We know they circle around all the way up Zellwood to the top of Holmes. How does Mr. Bryan's presence on the road that day, whatever he thought he was doing, okay, because if the idea is that he imprisoned Mr. Arbery by himself, but somehow, and those are the words he uses, that he cornered Mr. Arbery by himself, I guess, between his truck and the mailbox, I don't know, between his truck and the marsh, I, I, I don't know, the state will have to explain the theory to you, but the truck can go a lot faster. Mr. Arbery, if he's superhuman, might be doing five or six miles an hour, maybe seven. That pickup truck is capable of probably driving 100 miles an hour, maybe 90. Mr. Bryan's presence on the road has nothing to do with the ability of the McMichael defendants to cut Mr. Arbery off. Why? Because even though Roddy Bryan doesn't know it, Matt Albenzi has cut off one of the two exits from the neighborhood. And the McMichaels are already at the top of Holmes. They've cut off the second. Mr. Bryan is not trapping Mr. Arbery. He's trapped the moment the McMichaels get to the top of Holmes. It doesn't really matter what Roddy does. Now, they do come down the road. And there is a brief time period before the shooting where technically Mr. Bryan is behind Mr. Arbery. But it's clear by this point, it's certainly clear to Mr. Arbery, that he cannot outrun the McMichaels. No matter where he goes, they can follow. So again, how is Mr. Bryan's presence on this day in any meaningful way the cause of this shooting? And by the time Mr. Bryan gets around the dog leg, Mr. Arbery is already well within range of the shotgun that Travis McMichael is holding and the handgun that Gregory McMichael has. So if their intention, and again, I'm not suggesting that it's their intention, but if the McMichaels meant harm to Mr. Arbery, if they meant to shoot him that day, what in the world does Mr. Bryan's presence out there have to do with anything? I would submit to you that this is basically all a smokescreen from the state because Mr. Bryan's presence doesn't con contribute in a direct or substantial way to the death of Mr. Arbery. Because the McMichaels were certainly capable of catching up with him and shooting him if that was their intention. One more proximate cause issue I want to discuss on these four felony murder counts because it's basically the same issue. And the issue 
The principle is one of intervening acts. The judge is going to instruct you that the, it must, that the causation must be direct and it must be substantial. And although the charge doesn't use the words, essentially it must be unbroken. Anything that breaks the chain of causation prevents a return of a verdict on felony murder. Objection. Um, obviously, there's an issue. That is. Um, Mr. Goff, if we could please, um, if you were going to make representation with regard to the law that will be charged to the jury, yes. if we could remain within the charge that has already been approved by the court and that will be read by the court. Um, Let me, uh, thank you, Art. Let me go back and make sure I haven't misspoken. The court is going to charge you, I believe, that the felony must have directly caused the death or played a substantial and necessary part in causing the death. In this case, what I'm suggesting to you is that if either the actions of Mr. Arbery or the actions of Travis McMichael or the actions of both contributed to Mr. Arbery's death, then Mr. Bryan cannot be the direct, the substantial, and the necessary cause of that death. What am I talking about? I think it's already been referenced. I could be wrong. I don't want to misspeak. That Travis, I'm sorry, that Ahmad Arbery turns in front of the vehicle at the last, the, the, the white pickup truck at the last moment uh, and basically meets Travis McMichael in the front of the truck. We can't see in front of the truck, but we know that's where they are. The question for you is, and I'm not trying to decipher who did what or why, because from Mr. Bryan's perspective, it doesn't matter. It does for yours, but for Mr. Bryan's perspective, it doesn't matter. But Mr. Arbery's decision at that last moment to turn left instead of right, as Mr. Bryan would have expected, as you can tell from the way he's angling his phone, anticipating Mr. Arbery's path of travel, when Mr. Arbery turns to the left, does that not break the causal chain in this case? I would submit that it does. Whether Mr. Arbery is justified in turning and coming at Mr. McMichael or not, that's for you to decide. That affects other people in this case. But Mr. Bryan is not responsible for that. That breaks the chain. The causal chain is no longer substantial and necessary. It's no longer direct. Likewise, when Mr. Travis McMichael closes the distance from to the left of the truck as you're looking at it on the screen towards the middle of the truck or exactly where I'll let you all figure that out. But when Travis McMichael does that, regardless of whether Travis McMichael is justified in doing so, doesn't that also break the direct causation? Does it not also break the substantial and necessary part of Mr. Bryan in causing the death of Mr. Arbery. I would submit to you that Mr. Bryan cannot be the direct and substantial and necessary cause of Mr. Arbery's death. Whether that is the fault, for lack of a better phrase, of Mr. McMichael, the fault of Mr. Arbery. All right, this attorney poses the question to the jury. Did his client, William Roddy Bryant, cause a direct relationship with this crime against Ahmaud Arbery? All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. We're going to take you back to court. We're closing arguments continue in Brunswick, Georgia. The argument being, listen, the actions of William Roddy Bryant were different from those of the other two defendants, and he should not be found guilty. On the roadway 
of Mr. Bryan's aggressive driving. Where are the tire tracks, the brake marks, the skid marks? For all the times, Mr. Bryan supposedly has stopped short or changed direction so that it doesn't destroy anything. There's simply no physical evidence of aggressive driving. What about the lumber in the back of the truck? Uh, you know, the evidence shows it's still in the back of his truck afterwards. There's no evidence that any of those timbers went through the back of his windshield. No evidence Mr. Bryan had to drive back around the neighborhood picking them up. No evidence of damage to the bed line or the tailgate. Uh, I don't believe there's evidence of even a scratch attributed to all the acrobatic maneuvers implied by the state. I'm not sure there's even a picture of the front of Mr. Bryan's truck in evidence, but if there is, I'm sure Ms. Donikoski will provide it for you. Uh, nobody's been looking for that evidence because there was no crime to investigate. There are no witnesses. Nobody will testify that they saw Mr. Bryan drive aggressively or recklessly. No neighbors will testify to that because it didn't happen. We have a neighborhood chock full of security videos. None of them catch this aggressive driving. What does the medical examiner tell us? The medical examiner testified extensively in this trial. He testified, I believe, that the pickup truck could be a deadly weapon, depending on the manner in which it was used. And that's consistent with the charge this court is going to give you. But what evidence is there that Mr. Bryan did, in fact, injure Mr. Arbery? I don't recall there being any testimony of any physical injuries to Mr. Arbery attributable to Mr. Bryan's actions. The cause of death was gunshot. Let's talk about the fingerprint evidence for a moment. The fingerprint or palm print is at the driver's side door on the side of the pickup truck. Mr. Bryan points this out in the minutes after the shooting to Officer Minshew. There are no prints or cotton fibers in the front, on the front of the truck or on the back of the truck. Now, last I checked, unless you're a Hollywood stunt person, maybe uh, a veteran of Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift, you're not in control unless you're out of control. I think that was the trailer for the movie. Absent something extraordinary like that, we know the pickup trucks don't move sideways. We also know, when I said earlier there was no witness, we have a witness, and that's Travis McMichael. Travis McMichael testified about the events of 2-23-20. Travis McMichael did not testify to aggressive driving on the part of Roddy Bryan. Travis McMichael testified, I believe, to Mr. Arbery attempting to get in Roddy Bryan's vehicle, not once, but twice. Um, carjacking is a felony. Attempted carjacking is a felony. You will be charged on what attempt is. Um, but the point here is that the objective evidence is not that Mr. Bryan was engaged in aggressive behavior. The evidence is that Mr. Arbery was. Uh, and I don't say that as, as, as a measure of disrespect to Mr. Arbery. That's just what the testimony is. Um, and I think the state questioned that. I could be wrong, but if I could remind the jury, uh, I believe during the testimony of uh, Special Agent Jason Sechrist, during that testimony, I, I believe I specifically referenced page 54 of that transcript. There's a, there's a time there when Roddy By Bryan is testifying and he says, he's coming back at me and I'm like, oh, blank, excuse me, again. And I started a kind of evasive action, which we see on the video, and dropped the phone. So long before Mr. Ryan has any reason to believe that anybody else has seen this, he's provided that information. <clears throat> I'm getting a look. What time is it? <clears throat> Getting back to Mr. Bryan's statements, as I've indicated before, context is the key. It's not what the words Mr. Bryan's using. It's the truth, the meaning that he's attempting to convey with them. And I think I may have used the example before. If I were to say, I ran into your ex in the parking lot at Walmart, you wouldn't assume I ran them over, although technically you could interpret the words that way. There are a lot of words that we use. When we talk uh, on this coming weekend, when Bulldog fans talk about wrecking tech, we don't actually expect that they will. It's a figure of speech. And again and again, through the examination of these officers, we see that the words that the state has taken 
have been taken out of context. We see that they've been juxtaposed in inappropriate ways uh, to suggest a conversation that was different than it was. Uh, but I can tell you remember this discussion previously, so I'm going to truncate that discussion by pointing out the obvious. Three police officers interview Roddy Bryan. They don't Mirandize him. They don't tell him that he's under investigation, because he's not. At the time of all these interviews, Roddy Bryan is a witness. At the conclusion of the Glynn County Police Department report, Roddy Bryan is still a witness. Roddy Bryan may not be careful with his words, because Roddy Bryan's never been told anybody's looking at him. But the bottom line is this. Three good, solid police officers that you heard testify, all interview Mr. Bryan, all of them write written summaries of their reports. I think I went through the five-page version of Mr. Secrets. I think I went through the versions of the other officers, not the transcripts, but their actual summaries. Three police officers who know exactly what they're doing interview Mr. Bryan. None of them interpret his words to suggest that he committed an aggravated assault. None of them interpret his words to suggest that he was involved in any false imprisonment. None of them read, none of them hear that in what he says. And I would humbly suggest to you that if three police officers interview Mr. Bryan for what turns out to be a total of hours, okay, you remember we, we had an argument about how long the transcripts were and what that would mean. I don't care how you break it down. Three experienced police officers interview Mr. Bryan. None of them summarized for their superiors that Mr. Bryan attempted to run over Mr. Arbery, attempted to strike Mr. Arbery, or attempted to imprison Mr. Arbery. It's not there. And if that isn't a reasonable doubt on count seven aggravated assault, I just don't know what it would be. Before I leave count seven, I do want to discuss lesser offenses. I'm not really sure why we call them lesser offenses, but that's what we call them. With respect to the aggravated assault count, with respect to Mr. Bryan only, the court is going to charge you on three lesser offenses. Two of them are, are pretty much garden variety. One of them is a traffic offense. Uh, we'll leave those for your consideration. The third one I do want to discuss, however, uh, that is reckless conduct. We don't see that one as often, so let me take a minute and discuss that. Um, reckless con in reckless conduct, that offense is committed when a person commits reckless conduct when that person endangers the bodily safety of another person, person by consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his act or omission will cause harm or endanger the safety of the other person. And the disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care which a reasonable person would exercise. I would suggest to you that Mr. Bryan did not consciously disregard a substantial unjustifiable risk. It is the bottom of the hour. We need to take a break, but we're continuing to listen to this attorney argue that it was not um, uh, involved in the crime, but rather just a witness. We'll be right back here on Court TV. Welcome back. We're going to take you back to court live. I just want to mention the closing argument is now focused on false imprisonment. Specifically, Attorney Goff is saying even if he blocked his way in the car, blocked his path, wasn't false imprisonment. Let's go back to court. She has been falsely imprisoned. The third customer, the college freshman, for whatever reason, ignores the bank robber. The college freshman says nothing but runs out the door just as fast as he can. He never looks back. When his parents call later that day asking how he's doing, the college freshman doesn't even mention his near-death experience. The college freshman, although certainly fortunate to be alive, has not been falsely imprisoned. Likewise, in the case before us under Georgia law, I would respectfully submit to you whatever other crimes may have been committed that day, Mr. Arbery was not falsely imprisoned prior to his tragic death. And Ms. Donikowski may see things differently for reasons that should soon be clear. She may contend, remember, <coughs> under Georgia law, she always gets the last word, that Mr. Arbery did somehow submit in the last moments of his life to a combination of the harsh verbal commands of the McMichael defendants, if they did so, and the brandishment of the shotgun, if that happened. That's not exactly the way I recall the evidence, but I would submit that there's still no false imprisonment here as a matter of law. 
Why? Please look more carefully at count eight. Mr. Bryan is not charged with falsely imprisoning Mr. Arbery with either verbal commands or guns. That is not how the indictment reads. It alleges that Mr. Arbery was confined and detained, quote unquote, using said pickup trucks. The Cobb County District Attorney, I would suggest that you should hold them to that language. Nor does count eight allege that Mr. Arbery was falsely imprisoned on Burford. Count nine alleges an attempt to commit false imprisonment on Burford. We'll come back to that. But count eight uh, does not allege that Mr. Arbery was falsely imprisoned on Burford. Now, that may be where the state contends the chase started, but the indictment alleges the false imprisonment with pickup trucks happened on Holmes. The state contends that what you see on the now, that's what the state contends you see on the now famous video. We'll come back to that. There are other several legal principles we should review before I move on. Again, I think I've discussed this. Abandonment is a defense to the charge of false imprisonment. And I think I've been through that, so I won't torture you with that again. We're getting here. The things I've already covered, I'm not going to repeat for you. All right. I'm trying to find. We've covered that. All right. Attempted false imprisonment. In count nine, Roddy Bryan is charged with attempted false imprisonment on Burford Drive. He's not charged with attempted false imprisonment on Holmes, only Burford. Uh, there are reasons for that, but they're really not relevant to this discussion. The court will charge you that in order to commit the crime of criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment, the state must prove intent to commit false imprisonment because that's required to be a party to the crime. In other words, to prove the, an attempt, which is what is known as an inchoate crime, the state must show Mr. Bryan's specific intent to falsely imprison Arbery. In other words, for the attempt charge, Mr. Bryan would have to know that the McMichaels with whom he had not spoken lacked probable cause. Now, whether you ultimately determine that the McMichaels had probable cause or that Mr. Bryan had it on his own, uh, there obviously was some considerable testimony about his uh, trailer being taken, some, uh, something taken out of a family member's truck. Uh, he had indicated he got the security system because of concerns. He had heard a bunch of stuff at work, but specifically with respect to the McMichaels, because he's not spoken to the McMichaels, he can't have the specific intent to help them falsely, in, in, uh, falsely imprison Mr. Arbery. It's just a quirk of the law that he doesn't, he can't be convicted on that basis. Now, almost done. When I go home this evening to 174 St. Clair, I will be sleeping soundly for the first time in a while. Because this case, hopefully, will be, if, be have been submitted to you by then and my work will be done. Ms. Dunikowski is going to get the last word. I ask yourselves to ask the questions that I will not be able to. Please don't allow any more cheap shots. No more gotcha moments in this case. Uh, you will recall the state, I believe that was Ms. Donikowski, playing the video of a utility truck stopping at the English residence and the guy jumps out to use the porta potty, which was relevant to absolutely nothing other than Ms. Donikowski's desire to reinforce for you the fact that Mr. Arbery was dead 
that was clearly inappropriate. It was what I call a gotcha moment. And I would submit there's already been too much of it. You know, we've had professional witnesses come in here trying to tell you who you should believe. Again, please no more cheap shots in closing. And then, of course, we have the state talking about the death penalty for theft for which they were admonished by the court. And I'm not trying to rub it in, but I would suggest to you that given all of the cheap shots and all of the misstatements, I won't say they're knowing, we won't be jumping any assumptions, but given all the cheap shots in this case against Mr. Bryan, I would hope that when Ms. Dunikoski has the last word here, that you will hold her accountable and that you will not accept or tolerate any more cheap shots when I have no opportunity to respond. Again, I'm going to posit these three questions to you. When did Roddy Bryan know the McMichaels brought guns? When did Roddy Bryan know Travis McMichael would shoot Mr. Arbery? And at that point, what could Roddy Bryan possibly have done to stop it? Mr. Bryan put his faith in the Glen County Police Department. And then he put his faith in the GBI. He put his trust in law enforcement. He put his trust in our government to do the right thing by him. His trust was not rewarded. And now he finds himself before you. We place Roddy Bryan's fate in your hands. We ask you to return a verdict of not guilty on all counts. I ask you to send Roddy Bryan home. Thank you. Thank you.